This is part of what was interesting to me in connection with this. Because uh, my thought has, is that, boy, electrical engineering has a hell of a good computer operator. <laughs> this is part of what was interesting to me in connection with history and my connection with Jim Britton is uh, because my thought has, is that, boy, electrical engineering has really changed the way people live, and it's going to continue to do it. You ready? Yeah. The reason I ask about IFAC, uh, Harold, is that it appears to me that uh, even though we have this mass communication worldwide, those oceans are still pretty big. And from my perspective, anyway, you look at the developments in Europe and it's not clear how, what the best mechanism is for Ameri the American engineering community to participate in this whole thing. That in itself is a, a question I was gonna ask you about. How, how, how do I, as an engineer, you know, have an impact on this situation as it develops in Eastern Europe? Or can I, or should I even be worrying about that? Well, I think you should be worried about it. You know, basically, <clears throat> The environment in which control engineering or any engineering takes place is determined by what goes on in the, in the country or the nation in which you live. And you know, like, I'm, like we mentioned earlier, I grew up in an environment uh, which was a depression. But also, uh, I grew up in an environment uh, through World War II and so on, in which Boy, my life really wasn't my own, even though I didn't go to, uh, to the battlefield. Uh, you know, I couldn't run a car, I couldn't eat meat, I couldn't have sugar. I don't think, you know, World, World War III is going to help the situation at all. <laughs> In other words, uh, I would like to provide for my family and, and my country an environment in which nations can work together, even though they may differ on this, that, and the other thing. They may have to go to court to settle something. Uh, but at any event, it's highly important, I think, for the success of civilization, is that the people who are creating some of these technological changes realize that they're doing something that can be very useful to maintaining stability and peace in the future. In other words, we have that potential. We haven't really addressed ourselves to it. I mean, may, people may say, well, you know, what you're talking about is poppycock, it ain't going to happen. But, you know, if you were to tell somebody that you were able to transmit uh, pictures from what's going on in a basketball game out in Portland to, to uh, Atlanta here, and people could, you know, if you did that a hundred years ago, people would say, you're crazy. And as a matter of fact, for the guys who were working in GE labs there in the 20s, you know, they probably woke up many nights thinking, yeah, we must be crazy because we can't do it. But they didn't quit. They kept trying. And my feeling is peace is worth, worth working for. Yeah, that leads me to a question, sort of a derivative of what we've been talking about, and that is that the way engineers have traditionally been chain, trained in this country, there's very little emphasis on participating in the public forum. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's unusual, I think. You're an unusual engineer in the sense that you're willing to enter the public forum and argue for what you think is right in terms of technology. Do you think we need to maybe change our education of engineers a little bit so that they're more willing to do this kind of stuff, that they're more willing to get into the public forum and argue for the technology that they believe in and to, you know, participate in, in endeavors that are going to lead to a more stable environment? Well, yeah, I, I think that, uh, <clears throat> well, I think that change, sort of change, is taking place. I, I remember being down here several years ago, maybe 20 or so, and you didn't have people studying history of technology the way you do today. And uh, Professor Kranzberg, I guess, is down here, and Jim Britton. Uh, these, these people are historians. They, they have looked at the past and look at, sort of have their own ideas about extrapolation into the future. But I, I think the environment for 
educating uh, engineers is, is uh, improving. And I know at MIT they got in, uh, when I went there, they didn't have any uh, uh, management school. They didn't have, well, they may have had a business school. Didn't have management. They didn't have a uh, international relations. I don't, I don't remember exactly the, the head of the, the title of the department at MIT, but, but certainly they have uh, people who are working in the field of uh, international affairs. Yeah, I guess it's in a, uh, international affairs. I know I think it ends up by having the initial CIA, but, <laughs> but that isn't what they do. So I, may, but the problem, of course, is that there's so damn many things that you should be educating people that there's a tendency to feel, well, if the engineers are studying politics, they'll end up by being politicians instead of engineers. And I don't know, maybe the thing to do is to have supper clubs or what have you, which, of course, the liberal arts schools have had, where they get people from different uh, disciplines to sit down and, and live together and uh, talk about what they're doing. So it may not be that you'll have to have a lot of formal courses. One of the things that I learned about this, uh, this co-op course that I mentioned, going back to that, that co-op course was strongly at the vagaries of the economic cycle. <laughs> and it turned out that several times when we were supposed to go out to cooperate, gee, he says, I'm sorry, our business picture is such we can't hire you. Uh, maybe in a few weeks we'll be able to do it. You know, I mean, how are you going to run a university and uh, maybe in a few weeks we'll do it. But anyway, uh, MIT uh, had selected us to go to co-op and they said in six weeks uh, GE will have us. Okay, so what are you going to do for six weeks? So they basically said, uh, what would you like to study? <laughs> and so we took uh, a series of of uh, six weeks courses. I took photography, I took uh, geology, I took a course in human relations. So these were really just mini courses. But at least it, it opened my eyes so that I got interested in the national parks and visit them and see all the geological farm foundations and photography has been part of my life. So that, uh, you know, there are a lot of ways you can get educated without necessarily taking up a semester of uh, of prime time. There is a tendency uh, here, and I suppose in other universities, to try to uh, break down some of the barriers between the uh, social sciences and the, and the engineering and science community and form uh, research teams that involve members from all those different areas in what really amounts to large-scale systems projects. Mm -hmm. uh, you think this is going to happen uh, on a large scale in the university system in the next 5, 10, 15 years? I see it happening here. I just wonder if you think it's going to happen elsewhere. Well, <clears throat> there was a time when I did some recruiting for GE and I visited a lot of universities, but I haven't done that recently, so I really don't know. My, my impression is that, uh, you know, the 60s and 70s and, uh, and 80s have had quite an effect on the universities and uh, my feeling is that they're willing, a lot more willing, to, to change than has been the case. And also, I think, uh, I think this co-op course uh, idea might uh, permit ch some changes of that sort. But my impression is that the universities change pretty slowly. Yeah, there, there is that. Do you think the computer is going to stay the central element in this whole uh, large-scale systems business? Is it the, really the central player that's brought this on and is going to keep it going? I mean, we've seen in, in your, your my lifetimes, when I was a kid, 60, 1960, as transistor was five bucks. Now for for five bucks you can buy more calculator than you can use. Do you think that this this machine, this computer, this digital machine is going to stay at the center of our uh, analysis of these large-scale systems. Is it, is it really the, was it really the genesis for this whole business anyway? Uh, well, I wouldn't say it was a genesis of it. I think it makes it a lot easier, and I think it's definitely here to stay. I mean, whether you admit it or not, I mean, every time you check out a McDonald's, you know, they, yeah, it's, all they, it's all computerized, and uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm looking forward to the next five or ten years when people who have been playing around with PCs from the time they were kids hit hit uh, 
high school and college. I mean, I just think that the whole the whole business of teaching can be just vastly different. I mean, with a cable, you know, when I was in China, I think like in 85, 86, they were teaching on prime time, they were teaching people electronics. And you'd see sine waves and flip flops. And that was a television message. But at any event, I think there's just a lot more education that can be done by the rank and file of individuals. And I, I think that the computer will continue to have a very dominant influence. I mean, for example, you know, you know we're talking about the IEEE. Uh, I don't think there was even a computer uh, committee until the mid 50s. And now, the largest single element of technical activity in, in the IEEE is like 70,000 members of the computer society. And uh, they're just far outweigh all the rest, well, the rest of those societies. I won't say outweigh them, but I mean in, in number count, they just are very dominant. So I, I think, but in reality though, I have one point I want to make about systems. Systems didn't come into being with a computer. I mean, people use computers in various ways to help them make decisions, but, you know, we had uh, analog differential analyzers. We had uh, card uh, digital computers, uh, desktop digital computers. And the fact of the matter is we've had good power systems uh, since about the middle 30s. We've had telephone systems uh, for more than 100 years. We've got good television. We've got uh, our food system in the United States is just terrific. I mean, most people think that the food system begins at, the food chain begins at the local uh, price chopper or, or, you know, supermarket. But the, behind that is just a tremendous inventory control system and, and uh, you know, they freeze foods and you fly in stuff. I mean, you look at tomatoes, they're just as cheap in the winter as when they're flying them in from Chile as they are in the summer when they're growing them, you know, a mile away. It's just incredible, the systems that we have and which we take for granted. These systems, in, as you say, in large part, came into being before the computer. They, they were more or less, I guess, uh, engineered by... Experts. A, a, experts, a large enough group of people that those people themselves sort of comprised a computer in a sense. Lewis Mumford has argued this, that a, that a city, uh, that cities will never go away because cities in themselves constitute large systems of information that are well integrated and couldn't be uh, reproduced any other way. You know, that, that brings up an interesting point. When I was president of the IEEE, I traveled around uh, South America and there were about 11 major cities there, the, over a million people. Do you realize that at the beginning of the 1900s, there were, I think, six cities in the world that were over a million in population. And now, when if you think in terms of metropolitan areas, there are over 300 cities mm -hmm. that are over a million in population. And part of the reason that you could support those large populations things is because we have electricity. Now where the heck would you be if you're on the 10th floor and there's no electricity? Or the 80th floor? In other words, and, and, and in order to, to uh, be able to uh, uh, transport and move around, well, you've got uh, automobiles, they're largely they got a high electrical content. I think you could say in a, by the end of this uh, decade, uh, electrical content is going to be like a third of the automobiles. A, a half of the cost of an airplane is electronics or electrically related materials. So that, I mean, elect, you know, electrical engineers really are helping to shape society, whether they like it or not. And getting back to your question, should they be a part of it? They are a part of it. It's just that they're, they're not being maybe as effective as they ought to be. So in other words, we've really, the electrical part has really just changed uh, a great deal. And I think we're able to do better by virtue of having computers. But you know, there have been smart guys around for a real long time. And uh, it isn't just, uh, you know, 
the the uh, machines that they have to use. I mean, the people are so that I think with the machinery, there's every reason why we can do things that we couldn't do before, including get along with one another <laughs> without World War III. Yeah, because you seem to be suggesting that these large systems, uh, food systems, uh, power systems, communication systems, they've, they've grown into being and they were made work, ma made to work only in part, in part because of computers, mostly because of the interaction and uh, the feedback between a large number of highly skilled people who put them together and maintain them, sort of. So. Well, you know, it, in a way, if you think about it, <coughs> what is feedback control all about? It's closing the loop. And basically, a lot of systems that we have operating are basically operating open loop today. And I think that this is really an opportunity for a breakthrough of getting the control people and assistance people to work more closely together with, with whoever <laughs> is willing to listen. And, uh, and in this work that I've been doing in connection with Suisse is to identify, you know, if you only had a half a dozen major systems to operate, which ones would you pick? And certainly things like, like food and health and education uh, you know, the, there are a number of them which, Lord knows, we could be doing an awful lot better than than we are. And, you know, people have said, well, uh, you know, we need the military because it provides employment. I mean, when you look at the list of unfinished business that there is to be done, we need, uh, you know, just a... A, a larger, much more talented group of people working on some of these uh, social problems. And so I don't think that uh, we're going to run out of work. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it, it, uh, to, you know, in, as you look to the future, it's clear that the problems are going to get worse. We've got more and more people coming along. In 10 years, we'll have another billion people on this world. So how are you going to feed them, house them, and so on? And uh, we just got to be able to be more efficient in the future. Yeah, we may have to reach a point where the stability problem becomes unmanageable if we get that many people. Though I think. Well, but the sooner you start working on the problem, the more likely you are to come up with a decent solution. And if you wait until, well, as we know with the overshoot, you know, if you get going too fast, uh, you're <laughs> able to, you aren't able to stop in time. Um. Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, your wife, uh, Irma Ruth, who's a, in her own right a, a very talented and successful person. How big an influence has she had on you? How, how do you measure that? Hmm. Now you're getting down <laughs> to, to real problems. Well, first of all, uh, I considered getting married to Irma Ruth was the best thing that ever happened to me. And uh, she's just a very a very skilled and talented and perceptive and, and personable person. And uh, you know, I've taken her around uh, to uh, many of the <clears throat> IFAC and IEEE activities. As a matter of fact, you know, she's my best friend. So uh, I, I have benefited greatly by being married to her. Is the fact that she's technically trained been an advantage? Has it made it easier to, for her to see what you were doing and for you to talk about all these uh, projects you were involved in? Well, when you say technically trained, you, well, you have to realize a she's a mathematician. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <I'm> <laughs> all right, teasing. I see how Because in reality, she's just a hell of a, a, a good person when it comes to making stuff work. Uh, I can remember when we got our first... Uh, automatic uh, uh, clothes washer and uh, it was just after the war and we had kids that needed diapers washed and so on and the damn thing wouldn't work. <laughs> I could have a picture of her. She was sitting there reading the, the manual that said how to install it and how to make it work and the guy from the ser service guy from uh, the place where we bought the, the machine was there and she'd say well now the red wire, where does that go? Does that go to F1 or F2? <laughs> she was reading and he was doing it. <laughs> so she's really uh, very, very skilled and in, in able to do many things and uh, also very hardworking and uh, 
I like her. <laughs> <laughs> I but, know you like uh, her. I, I was curious. The reason I, part of the reason I asked that question is uh, there's a, sort of a continuing problem of encouraging women to get into the uh, engineering field and the uh, technical fields in general. You've mm -hmm. now beginning to see a decline again in the number of women who go into this field. I don't know if there's any answer to this question. I thought maybe you might have some ideas on that. Well, I agree that it's uh, important, and uh, I think. Uh, I think a, a problem that that women have is that uh, you know many of them are very smart, but not often is a is a man willing to marry somebody that's smarter than they are, and uh, so to that extent, in terms of the women being interested in in uh, having a marriage and a successful life in that sense, so I I think that that they're less inclined to want to go to work in, in engineering uh, rather than be at home with their family and and if they do do something like for instance Irma Ruth ended up by being uh, in charge of uh, educational administration in a community college and uh, even though she might have done good work in, in the engineering field she chose administration rather than, than engineering to continue. But it's systems work anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. The human equation there to fool. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult problem. I don't know what the answer to that is, but uh, I appreciate your answer because, in, indeed, we're having trouble keeping women in this profession for some reason. Okay, can we stop for just a minute? I want to see where we're Hal, let's take the natural progression of your career from uh, the defined systems to the poorly defined systems. And let's take it to its natural end, which is to look at the planet Earth itself as a system. It seems to me we have two things to consider here. One is we need better models of what's going on. And even given that we get those models together, the population pressures and other factors are going to call for some uh, fairly sophisticated control techniques if we're going to keep this thing uh, moving in a direction that's useful for the people on this planet. How do you feel about that? Is this an opportunity maybe to uh, look at both the large-scale system problem and the control problem in, in a unified environment? Well, I quite agree. I think it's a good way of looking at it. I mean, uh, <clears throat> if you look at the past uh, hundred years, we just have a a lot of tools, techniques, ideas that, that people didn't have before. We got the capability of, of transporting ourselves to other places to get together with people. And uh, we know an awful lot about control that we didn't know before. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the, at, at the threats, in other words, in a system sense, you know, what, what failure modes could you go into? It's, it's pretty clear that there are a lot of them. I mean, we could run out of energy, uh, so will sooner or later, at least in the conventional forms. And it seemed to me that uh, this is an excellent opportunity to uh, further control uh, systems, uh, control systems uh, people, the uh, systems man in cybernetics, uh, and uh, computers, communication, the whole whole bunch of different activities to essentially say, you know, what can we do to to make a better world in the future? And I think the uh, the IEEE is a good mechanism of that sort. Uh, we certainly have access to literally hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And I think like any systems problem, essentially you, it seemed to me it's highly desirable that you develop a set of needs. In other words, what is it that would be desirable for us to be able to do that we can't do right now? And uh, certainly the, uh, the opportunities in Eastern Europe uh, for people to study that sort of thing are, are quite, uh, uh, quite unusual. I mean, it isn't often that you get so many people willing to consider alternatives. And uh, I mean, they pretty well agreed that they want to change, but it isn't clear exactly what should they change to. And I think that uh, 
maybe through through IFAC, the IEEE, maybe through the Academy of Engineering, uh, if we could uh, uh, essentially come up with a, a wish list of uh, good things that we would like to see done in the next uh, 10, 20 years. And uh, I think this would be highly desirable. And I think we have the, the skills and the talent that we're, we've been sort of worried that uh, We'd run out of jobs to do, but uh, my feeling is that isn't the case at all. Uh, Doc, for one second. What's happened? Well, I, did, I didn't realize it, but y'all moved this chair and it kind of changed stuff, so we need to. Okay, and, and we're going to do one more question, one more answer, and then we're going to have to change stage, John. Okay, sure. Are you ready? Okay. Uh, well, in that regard, uh, Hal, what, how do you think that, that IFAC and, and, and the IEEE and organizations of that nature can affect this problem? Is it, is it their place maybe to, are they in a position to say to apply pressure to governments to f ask for the formation of some super group of, or some international group of scientists and engineers who can uh, collaborate to study these kind of problems? Is that, is that the approach that, that might work or? Is it going to go on at lower levels than that? Yeah, I would say uh, <clears throat> it could go on at, at lower levels. I mean, my impression is that if you put together, uh, you being the uh, Control System Society or uh, our Systems Managed Cybernetics, or if you could essentially put together a proposal saying we would like to do this and uh, get some money, I don't know how much it would take, but but we've made studies of in the past of what what needs to be done in the control field in the future. Why don't we have a focus in on what what happens if we take a look at the planet Earth and and uh, what what are desirable things for us to be working on in the next ten twenty years? In other words, to come up with a a needs statement, as it were, mm -hmm. and some sort of an estimate in terms of. Uh, what will it take to uh, to accomplish it? So, in other words, you'd, you'd think in terms of some uh, joint project between several of these societies, like yeah. you know, System Management Cybernetics and CSS, uh, saying, "Look, let's uh, allocate some money and study this problem and see what input each society has to this thing and how this thing." Could yeah, be. you could go to TAB or something like that from the IEEE and. Uh, it's a question of maybe partitioning the problem. Maybe, for instance, the communication society might get together with the uh, with the Eastern Europe and so on. And uh, maybe the thing to do would be to uh, pick out a, a few major tasks that that ought to be looked at. Because it seemed to me that we talk about change, but change frequently involves. Uh, not much change for a long, for quite a while, and then suddenly a, an abrupt uh, discontinuity, like the OPEC oil. Uh, or the situation. events in Eastern Europe here. Uh, events. Almost, and, uh, and it seemed to me that uh, that's one of the things we learned about <clears throat> modeling, and that is maybe the models aren't very good, but at least it gives you a chance if something changes radically to see what the effect of that is. So I think that we're in an unusual opportunity. One of the things which was uh, a, a question mark in my mind was, when we got started with this, was uh, why are we dwelling so much on the past? And it seems to me that the reason we're dwelling on the past is that it provides us with an opportunity to see what we should be doing in the future. And so in this sense, I'm, I'm very pleased that our our conversation is focusing on the future because that's the only thing you can really do much to change. And uh, so uh, I would say at least this is something that's worth thinking about and maybe somebody else has a better idea. But certainly the problem is one that I don't think many people have anticipated and I'm not sure that uh, if we don't do some sort of a study like this that the solution we're going to come up with is going to be as as good as we could if we had given it considerably more thought. Stuff sort of seems to go on uh, 
uh, independently of each other. There doesn't seem to be any feedback between the, the various elements to some extent. It's kind of worrisome but, in a way. But that was part of the benefit that we got from uh, forming A squared C squared, was that we could find out what the aeronautical engineers were doing or the chemicals, which wasn't much. But at any event, you know, the fact is that uh, th they, I think, probably gained more from that exchange than we did. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the international organization IFAC. If you go to one of these meetings, there's there's the obvious formal information change at the level of the papers that are presented, but there must be secondary and maybe even more important information exchanges that go on uh, among the individuals who participate. Could you comment on that a little bit? Well, I, I think uh very definitely, there are personal contacts that you make. I, know, I remember one of the <coughs> people in the Soviet Union who was a, an expert on sample data systems developed quite a strong uh, correspondence with uh, someone in the States who was uh, interested in sample data systems. And, in, in a num and as a matter of fact, this Apollo Soyuz lash up. You remember back in 1975? Uh, uh, the Apollo uh, astronauts and uh, the uh, uh, Soviet uh, Soyuz astronauts uh, linked up in space and there was a sort of a gesture of friendship. But the fact is that there, there are quite a few experts, if you will, in the control business uh, who attend conferences are able to uh, find out what is happening in other places. I, I remember uh, in 1960, uh, when they had the first IFAC Congress, I was interested in uh, simulation of uh, dynamic systems, you know, like, uh, but using digital computers. And uh, I visited about five or six different countries and found no response at all. Nothing was being done. But lo and behold, I went to another country and they said, oh yeah, we've got one of those working. Well, that was... Uh, very useful information to me. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it pointed out uh, a good way to go. I came back to the States and I mentioned this in a talk that I gave uh, on my way back. A fellow from GE said, well, that sounds pretty good, but we got something better than that. And lo and behold, he did. And as a matter of fact, I hired him to work with me. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of technical information. There's also personal uh, awareness of what goes on in a country uh, that uh, is very beneficial in the long run. So I think there are a number of uh, both tangible as well as intangible benefits. Yeah, a colleague of mine who was a foreign national once said to me, he said, the trouble with Americans is they view the, and this is a while back, they view the Russians either 10 foot tall or 3 foot tall. <laughs> In truth, they're about the same size we are. Maybe this is one of the stabilizing effects that comes out of these conferences that, that uh, these experts in these various fields get to know each other. They can measure, the, measure each other in a sort of a qualitative way as well as uh, academic or uh, uh, some other way. You think that probably is just probably is almost as important as the papers that get transmitted, I would suppose. Well, I, uh, I sometimes feel that that's the way. <laughs> you mean some papers are better than others, of course. <laughs> but, but, uh, but certainly there is that element of, of personal knowledge. Well, I, <laughs> you know, working for 43 years with GE, you can't help but feel, you know, that when you go to a conference here, say, in the United States, uh, there are people from other companies that uh, are basically like, quote, the enemy in, in a commercial and economic sense. But nevertheless, you, you have to do business with them. And you don't tell them everything that you know, and they don't tell you everything that they know. Uh, so there are uh, both uh, benefits that that arrive from from technical knowledge, but also the personal uh, friendships and the and the sizing up of whether they're three feet or ten feet tall. That that all takes place, and it's worthwhile. Yeah, it seems to me it's very stabilizing of, uh, uh, effect in some respects. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question that uh, that is liable to come up in almost any conversation, and that is, uh, you can read almost any place that there aren't enough engineers. There's going to be a big shortage of engineers that there is, that there was. Do you think we're producing uh, enough engineers to keep our society moving in the directions it needs to move? 
Well, I, I would say there hasn't been a large unbalance in, in uh, recent times. I was uh, president of the uh, IEEE in 1973 when we were getting down off the peak of employment for the Apollo project. And there were a lot of unemployed engineers at that time. Uh, presumably there was a surplus, but when you look at the progress that has been made in connection with uh, these workstations and so on, it, my impression is that uh, we have quite a bit of flexibility and that if we needed many more engineers, we probably could bring them in from people who are computer uh, uh, experts, as it were. So uh, my feeling is that there is a, you know, a four to six to eight year gestation that it takes to train an engineer or develop an engineer. So you can't really change that time very much. But my feeling is though that with the computers and with the fact that we will now in the next five or ten years be getting uh, people in engineering who have been familiar with computers since they were kids in elementary school, I think that there's just going to be a, a great increase in the level of competence of people using computers in the future over what it is now. And maybe the, the most significant roadblock will be that the management who, ex who can accept or reject the results of these computer studies will be more tolerant than, than was the case uh, when I was uh, trying to work out, for instance, I was trying to sell the idea of management information systems. And you know, managers uh, resented being told that they could, uh, the machine could help them. Uh, most of them did anyway, and they didn't want to have any part, in many cases, of what the computer was all about. But uh, as time goes on, I, you know, every manager has a management information system of one sort or another. So uh, the short form of the answer is I think that uh, things are about okay in terms of the availability of engineers in the United States uh, versus the, uh, the need for them. I know there are other countries that uh, train more engineers than we do, but my impression is that they aren't always very uh, gainfully employed. Yeah, there's a tendency to say, well, the Japanese have so many more engineers than we do you know, in, in raw numbers and in percentage of the population, therefore they're going to be better off technically. It's, it's an interesting point to ask whether we should really do that. Let me ask you this. You, you started your engineering career and you've been at it 43, well, more than 43 years. Was there a point in that career, say 5, 10, 15 years into that career, when you felt like you'd reached a threshold of mastery of the profession? You know, do you remember reaching that threshold at some point and saying, having this feeling that you now had accumulated enough experience and uh, enough stuff that you could see larger problems and uh, proceed with a, with a more global view of what was going on? Well, in a way, that, was, that condition existed after I helped uh, get IFAC started. I was in the role of past president, which anybody who has been in that position knows that you've got a lot of good ideas, but nobody seems to pay any attention to them. <laughs> uh, and then I, it was at that point I started to try to get some information together on what was systems as a systems engineering as opposed mm -hmm. to control systems. And uh, that, that period in the uh, early to mid 60s, I wrote a couple of books about systems engineering tools and systems engineering methods. And it was, was a really a fun uh, thing for me because I would go around to the different, uh, well GE had a whole bunch of people working on systems various sorts, space and so on. And uh, it was fun to uh, ask them, you know, what do they do? How do they do their work? Uh, what is systems engineering in your place? And uh, as a result, I sort of uh, coalesced those ideas into those two books on systems engineering methods and system engineering tools. And uh, the thing which I found very very worthwhile was that uh, the, the systems, <laughs> it turns out that if you are successful at systems, 
and somebody asks you, how did you do it? You imply, well, you know, I have that particular skill and uh, because I was the leader of this, that was the reason it was successful. And since the guy was successful, you can't really argue with success. <laughs> On the other hand, if something wasn't successful, nobody would talk about it. The guy who was the manager of it had long since departed. So you really couldn't learn much if you were trying to study this stuff in retrospect. And if you really wanted to see what was going on and what was the, the things that were successful and what were, weren't, you practically had to document those as you went along. And in a way, this might be something that we could use in, in this European situation, is to encourage people essentially in a historical sense to be gathering data. In other words, what, what's, what's happening in Poland? Uh, what, what is it in 1990, what is it in 92, 93, and so on. In other words, we got a bunch of experiments cooking. Yeah. Well, what are we going to learn from them? And so it, it may well be that, uh, see, I mean, in a way that's what we're trying to do here today is capture something that I, uh, that we agree upon is, is worthwhile talking about. And I think that, uh, in a way, that could, in, and should be done in connection with our what's happening. Because uh, I'm sure this isn't the first time or the last time that, that abrupt changes are going to take place in the political and economic sphere. And uh, we, we could and should be learning more from it. Yeah. At least we need the data record so we can go back yeah. and look at it and see what happens. As a matter of fact, that is a part of systems uh, management that, that's really... Uh, pretty good. I mean, it's called configuration management. And basically what do you do is you describe the state of the system at any particular time. And you keep doing that and you realize what the changes are and then in retrospect you can piece together what happened. And so I think there are some uh, systems uh, techniques and approaches that we could be looking at at this particular time that could be useful to us in the future. If, if you look at your books and you look at the papers uh, that you were writing, there, there's, a, there's the intent, as I see it, to, to quantify as generically as possible what is involved in making an accurate system model. You know, what are the components that go into making a model that has some chance of being successful. And in the 60s, there was even a curriculum called system science. You know, how, how far can you go with this? Uh, Genericity, if you will, isn't there a, finally a point at which you have to know something fundamental about the physical system you're working on? Uh, no, very definitely. There's, there's a, there's a, there seems to be a, a limit to how general you can make these things. At some point, you have to have a real good gut feel for what's going on. Yeah, well, th that was really the part of what kept me in GE during that whole 40 years. I was was able to go and. Uh, f visit and work with people who were working on different systems. I mean, like the Apollo bunch, uh, uh, the reentry systems group under Otto Klima. He did some very interesting work. Uh, uh, the people out at uh, Erie and their transportation systems. And I worked with the people in uh, generation, uh, power system generation, large steam turbines and gas turbines and so on. And uh, so, you know, I think, well, the fact of the matter is that decisions uh, regarding, you know, the purchase of something or not purchasing something, uh, basically those decisions are made on the basis of several criteria. I mean, we frequently think that performance is the, the primary decision maker. A uh, basis for making decisions, but really that may or may not be the case. Uh, certainly, the cost of, of an article or a system is important. The reliability, the uncertainty. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different uh, criteria involved, and uh, so that uh, as I. Uh, as I think about it, uh, 
make, dealing with the general is, is okay, but you really learn a hell of a lot more <laughs> when you work with the specifics and it's idiosyncrasy. An example of that, I don't want to take too much time, but this Mark 56 gunfire control system, the people at the Rad Lab built and uh, designed it and they started to build it. But it turned out the war was over and they left to their several ways. And we got stuck, we and GE got stuck with finishing that job. And we really had to learn. Well, I mean, uh, normally if you studied a particular servo, uh, a matter of two or three months, that was, uh, you got to understand it pretty well. But here we had like 15 or, or 20 servos that had to be analyzed in, in less than a month. Boy, we just learned in a heck of a hurry. Some things were possible and other things were impossible. And so I think that, uh, that working on things in general is nice, but uh, after you think you got a theory that's working, let's try it once or twice and see whether it is all that good. There must be some synergism there, you know, you must yeah. work from the general to the specific and yeah, back. Right. And it's an iterative process, that's right. what engineering is anyway, probably when you get right down to it. Well, the curious thing about control is that uh, it starts out uh, embedded in larger problems. If you look at its history from my point of view, it, if you look at an airplane, you can, can look at an airplane as a control system, but the airframe engineer probably would not be happy to look at it that way. And there's a point at which we uh, differentiate control as a separate entity and start talking about control systems and control science. And yet, most control applications re remain embedded in uh, larger problems. I guess, these two things are working either at cross purposes or together. It probably is worthwhile to have some sort of uh, uh, specific control activity, but in the end it seems to me that these things have to be integrated back into a larger system. Yeah, well basically uh, the, a way of looking at this is the difference between an open loop system and a closed loop system. In other words, the uh, <coughs> the designer uh, has certain objectives, specifications and whatnot to work to, and in general he does as, as best he can to meet those uh, without control to begin with. And then, then you say, well, but that isn't good enough, or, or, the, or the characteristics of the process are changing. I mean, for instance, for instance in, an in an airplane, you have conditions at takeoff, you have conditions at, at uh, cruise, uh, you have conditions at landing, and, and so on, climb. And, and for each of those conditions, you may end up with a different configuration. And what you do is you build into the control as adaptive characteristics, which senses what it is that you should be doing now, and, and closes the loop and makes sure that that the actual system is better than you could do if you didn't close the loop. So uh, in, in that sense, I think the job of the control person is to essentially uh, make sure that, that the requirements or specifications are met as closely as they can be uh, and essentially takes into account the fact that there are different situations requiring different performance requirements. So I do feel that there is a need for both the control and the systems activities. Let me throw this out to you. It's a proposition that was put to me one time that in effect the people in the theoretical engine of the control business are working on a class of mathematical problems that mathematicians aren't interested in. and. Uh, that therefore they serve a function in and of themselves, that they're, they're pursuing mathematics that, that might not get pursued if it was left to the mathematicians uh, by themselves who may not be interested in this class of problems. And then you could argue, well, okay, they're working on this class of problems, maybe it's up to the practitioner to filter out of what they're doing what can be used. I don't know, that's, a, that's, that's one approach that seems to be uh, prevalent, you know, is that they, they take these fixed, and the theoreticians take a fixed model and they generate 
uh, information about it. And then it becomes a matter of somebody else uh, figuring out how to use that stuff. Well, you know, there was a period of time when all the controls were analog controls. And now, practically, most of them are digital controls. And one of the things which the, the control theorists really did is permit that transition to be made quite smoothly because they did all their study to sample data systems and so on in the early 50s. And by the time the computers were available and working, uh, the people that were there to use them. So, uh, and a uh, whole adaptive control, I think, is uh, it has been benefited from, from studies of a, of a theoretical nature. So, uh, I, my, my feeling is that, uh, that as long as the, the theoreticians and the practical people get together from time to time, and maybe these conferences are a way of doing it. A squared, C squared in particular probably right. is an uh, right. interesting place for these people to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. I think I'm about done, Hal. What do you think? I'm about done, too. <laughs> yeah, we got about, what, almost two hours of tape here? Yeah. I want to, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, when you wrote these books, they, they come in probably, what, uh, 20 years into your career? Maybe not quite that far, at some point there. Was, that, was this a, a, a really a, a fun experience, a pleasant experience to write these books at that juncture in your career? Did you, did you get a lot of pleasure out of uh, being able to sort of uh, put all this stuff together in book form? Yeah. Yeah. That, uh it was sort of a, a way of uh, putting down on paper some ideas that had been going through my head. In other words, I, I felt I learned, it was a learning experience for me. Uh, on the other hand, <laughs> it did have its drawbacks in the sense that it took a lot of time away from my family. And, uh, uh, but in, in the long run, I, I felt that I was way ahead for having done it. By the way, uh, there's a, a series of uh, articles that I've been writing since I retired on the supplemental ways for improving international stability. So um, we have three books in that series of activities that I helped edit. Uh, but basically, book writing is not a bad idea if you view it as part of a learning experience. In other words, it's a way of telling somebody else what you learned. Yeah, I would say that uh, books probably occupied a, a more prominent place, maybe not at that juncture than they do now. Now it seems to be more uh, attending conferences, looking at the papers, because things seem to be moving a lot faster. Right. You know, uh, and sometimes I get the feeling that we're, we're cutting this stuff up into too small a pieces, you know. It's very hard to assimilate the big picture by just looking at all these small uh, pieces of information that get published as paper. Yeah, the business of saying that a paper has to be five pages long. I mean, hell, if you're talking about, you know, reorganizing the planet and to do that in five pages, it comes out very dilute. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's probably a little bit harder to assimilate this stuff at this stage of the game. We haven't talked much about at all about your co-author on one of those books, uh, Bob Mayer. Yeah, how long did you know him? Was he a, a lifetime colleague, sort of? Uh, well, uh, he was a co-op student uh, from MIT. Also, he grew up in Schenectady. Although I had never met him prior to our, our starting to work with GE. He was two years behind me in school, and uh, he's a very practical guy, and he really can build stuff and make it work. His father was a machinist, and he taught Bob, uh, I guess, most of what he, his father knew, and uh, he's a very practical guy, and uh, I really have enjoyed working with him very much. How many years uh, did you work together? 
Well, actually, uh, it was largely on this uh, Mark 56 gunfire control system. He was uh, over at MIT for a matter of two or three years, and I mostly came in uh, over a period of uh, about a year, year and a half, when we were converting the development system into a, a, a prototype and uh, operating system. When you write a book together, is that uh, how does that go? Is that a, uh, uh, it probably has its, its, its hard moments or its well, it has its ups and downs. But uh, <clears throat> basically, I was interested in uh, in teaching this subject. I mean, uh, I worked for uh, a man by the name of Doctor Green, Doctor Charles F. Green, and he was responsible for uh, advanced development in this control in the aeronautics and ordnance business. And we had the problem of uh, building, you know, like uh, at any particular time, maybe 10 or 20 different servos, and we would build them and then put them on test. And sometimes they worked and sometimes they didn't. And so uh, Dr. Green was asked, uh, you know, can't we train people so that uh, when we start testing it, the, the product is, uh, meets the specs. And so I was given the job of trying to find out what there was in the way of literature and, and to put together a course in servo mechanisms. And uh, Bob was one of the advisors. We had sort of like an advisory group there of people from aeronautics and marine and, and uh, the different uh, uh, f functional departments. So I was given this job of teaching a course and uh, Bob was part of the the group that was advising us. And some of the stuff uh, he was really very good at, I mean the electronics part of it and so on. And uh, meanwhile he was very busy with other things and I was busy with other things so uh, we didn't get in one another's way. and. We sort of, well, like you write anything, you know, you do the first one or two and I'll do the next one and uh, somehow or another it got done and then we read one another's material. All in all, it was a reasonably an amicable situation. Uh, I wasn't suggesting it wasn't, I just was interested in this business of uh, co-authorship because it's, uh, it seems that it has the potential to make the, to make the effort much better because you get the synergism between two people mm -hmm. who may have, you know, uh, complementary you know, backgrounds in some sense, and it sounds like that, that was the case. Yeah, well, we also had uh, some of these other people on the advisory committee, you know, they were pretty good, and they were, uh, and the other thing is we used the stuff uh, as a basis for teaching our, our engineers. And as a matter of fact, you know, you were talking about mathematicians. The people that we were dealing with were not mathematicians. They were people who were motor designers or uh, built, uh, you know, equipment and the, the stuff had to be shock mounted and it had to be tested and all that stuff. So we were dealing with really practical people and they were free to criticize, you know, if something was a bunch of garbage or they say, why do you put that in? Well, you know, we had to answer that question, <laughs> either take it out or, or make it so they could understand it. That's the end of the tape. Yeah. Okay. That's where you take it.